And we're glad to have everyone here to be a part of this midweek Bible study. We're about ready to enter into John chapter six, uh, 13, John chapter 13. Let's keep in mind this study is apologetic in nature. By that we mean evidence is being shown by the apostle John that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten son of God. Therefore, he selects various witnesses as the Holy Spirit guides him so to do and presents them as proof that Jesus is deity. Now, we've been studying it in that way and urging everybody to read word for word each chapter as we've gone through it. We've tried to set out simply the facts of those chapters. Certainly, we again remind everybody we welcome any of your questions you may have that come up We'll be glad to address those also. One of the things I want to mention before we go into uh, John chapter 13 is what is set out in the latter part of chapter 12, verses 42 and 43. John chapter 12, 42 and 43. Notice that the scripture says, nevertheless, the chief rulers also uh, among the chief rulers also many believe. They believed on him, that is, the Christ. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now there's an interesting point here. For the most part, the whole denominational world says all you have to do is believe on Jesus Christ as your Savior, and you're saved. Well, it's very interesting that these priests, these rulers, these important people in the Jewish religion of that time, that many of them believed on him. Were they saved? I do not believe they were. They were not acceptable to Jesus Christ, for they would not confess their belief. And there was a reason for that, and Scripture tells us. And he's not just taking up room here just to tell some historical incident at that time. He says they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, you mean to tell me that the Lord's going to save somebody because he's concluded that he is the son of God, yet he will not confess it because he's afraid of men putting them out of positions of importance. Well, that tells us right then in his earthly ministry that though somebody believed there was something more to do than to simply assent to the fact that his miracles proved him to be the son of God. If they would not confess him, and they wouldn't. And the reason for it was they didn't want to be put out of the important positions they had in the synagogue where they couldn't even go to the synagogue. And that tells us their love was lacking. Jesus would say to the apostles in chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. The American Standard 1901 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. I don't see how we can say that these people, because they assented to the fact that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, but would not confess him because they feared being put out of the synagogues, that they loved him. They loved him, that obeyed him. They would have confessed him. So here again, even from the earthly ministry of Christ, the idea of belief only saving a person won't work. And there's much more to dissolve that idea, false doctrine, once you get into the uh, rest of the New Testament than it is right here, but here it is. And why can't people see that it takes more than mentally ascending to the fact that Christ is the Son of God? Belief, as it's used here. And that true saving belief encompasses obedience from the heart. Never has been belief only that saves. Well, holding that in mind, I'll sum up for a moment what we have 
as uh, Christ had presented himself to the Jews in this section of John. Uh, we do see, as chapter 12 closes out, that many believed on the Lord, yet at the same time, many did not. And we see that there were some who believed it wouldn't confess him. And we see the reason why, for fear of being put out of the synagogue. The Lord himself said that he was the son of God. He also said that he is the light of the world. And he said that he's the only one that can save the world, meaning to save those in sin of the world. But then he also indicates that he is the only one who will judge the world. So with those comments to revive what we've said and add this last part from verses 42 and 43 to it regarding this section of John, we'll move on then to uh, chapter 13. Now, when we enter chapter 13, we're seeing that he is busy about presenting himself to the disciples and more particularly the apostles of Jesus Christ. And we'll get into a lot of the things that has to do simply with what they were called to do, <clears throat> what they were called to do. And it's interesting that he starts out the first uh, 17 verses, 1 through 17 of this chapter, in teaching a great lesson on humility. Now, notice the setting is near the time of the Jewish Passover. And it says that Jesus knew that his time to depart this world had come so that he could go back to the, the Father. The scripture then says, having loved his own, he loved them to the end. Now, I want to spend a little time on the next point I want to make. It's found in verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Let's look at a few things about that and make some modern day applications. We see as we look at the narrative, the, as I just read, that Satan has put it into the heart, already put it in the heart of Judas Iscariot, the idea of betraying the Lord. Now, Follow me here. There have been those and still are who have said that the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, personally and directly indwells the Christian and that he in his personal and direct indwelling actually imparts divine strength to the inward man or the heart of the Christian to help him beyond his human power, to resist temptation to sin. They will cite a number of passages that tell us about the Holy Spirit indwelling the Christian. And when it's been asked of them about the direct work of the Spirit on the inward man, the heart of the Christian to impart strength, to impart wisdom directly, independent of a medium, then some of us have asked the question, when you have the statement as you do in verse 2 of chapter 13, that the devil put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him, does that mean that was a direct work of the devil on the inward man or the heart of Judas Iscariot? And frankly, that they found a hard time to say one is right, and this one could not be a direct operation of the devil on the heart of Judas Iscariot. They know that if they say, well, yes, it was a direct operation of the devil, on the heart of Judas Iscariot, that they leave themselves open to a great many problems that they have to deal with. Now, it's important to understand, as I think I said last week, 
that when Christ chose Judas, as he did with the rest of the apostles, he did not choose a liar, a person already caught up in things that made him wicked and would cause him to sell the Lord, if you please, sell him out. But these things simply developed in him because he was a free moral agent, just like every one of the rest of the apostles. And he could have repented of his sin of selling the Lord out, even as Peter repented of his sins. But he didn't, and he wouldn't. Now, what we have here is a mere statement of fact. We do not have further elaboration on how the devil put it in his heart. Now, in the Old Testament, you have comments made about Pharaoh. It says Pharaoh hardened his heart. It says God hardened his heart. It says his heart was hardened. Three different ways that the Old Testament scriptures record the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Well, are we to assume that because it says God hardened his heart, that that was a direct operation of God upon the heart of Pharaoh to harden his heart? intellect and his reasoning powers and his feelings his emotions so forth that he had no part in it himself at all well not at all we know that by the rejection of the truth that the miracles of Moses set out before him in the plagues of Egypt that that was plenty of information him to say God is behind all of this and when Moses said, let my people go, then his God is able to deliver them. Pharaoh's heart was hardened and resisted the message of Moses in the same way anybody's heart's hardened. And that also figures into understanding how the devil put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to sell the Lord, if you please. To betray him. So here's the fact of the matter. Did the devil do it? Yes. The scripture in a factual statement says that he did. We could put it in a proposition. True or false. The devil put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray the Lord. That's either true or false. Well, it's true. It's true but it doesn't tell us how it was done. We already know that Judas was a thief. He was already then, therefore, a dishonest person. He was not seeing things as the other apostles saw them. He was not forced against his will to deny the Lord by the devil or by anybody else. It's obvious also, after the deed was done, that he regretted it. But that tells us one can be sorry, very sorry, regret a bad thing in a great way, and yet still not repent, for he did not do that. He went out and hanged himself. Well, how did he come then to have the devil put it into his heart, the idea of betraying, it's by his own doings. The devil can't do anything to you or to me except that we allow it to happen. And so he cooperated in the matter. And there was no direct operation of the devil or anybody else, angelic or deity, on his heart to force him against his will to do what he did. And that's exactly how it is with men today. When the scripture says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that states a fact. We know that sin's the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. That's just a fact. You have to study through other passages of scripture to see how one is drawn away and enticed to break God's law to sin after his own lust. Thus, we have to be loyal as, is as, as loyal as is possible for us to be loyal 
to the word of God with a determination to obey it no matter what happens to us. That's why you have Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. Be thou faithful unto death, unto in order to death. If you must die in order to remain faithful, then die because you'll receive a crown of life. So nobody can force us against our will to do good or to do evil. There has to be a proper motive of the heart to do good and a wrong motive of the heart to do evil. And thus the Bible has so much to say concerning the inward man and to guard thy heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. Well, just think of Judas Iscariot. He let the wrong thoughts get in his mind for whatever reason. And the act came out of it, and thus he betrayed the Lord. Now, who is at the root of all of that? Who is the original murderer? And who is the father of lies? Well, it's Satan. But Satan works through instrumentality to bring about what he does. And he with us, to get us to sin, he works through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride or vainglory of life. And I can tell you now that one or a combination of those is how the devil entered into the heart of Judas Iscariot and gave him the idea to betray the Lord. So that needs to be said, needs to be understood about when you have a factual statement. That does not necessarily, in fact, it doesn't in and of itself alone tell you the how of a thing or even the when of a thing. It just tells you that such a thing happened or something else in a factual statement. So I wanted to spend some time on that point concerning that statement and supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. It's how he put it in there. And he put it in there the same way we put it in you or me to violate any of God's teachings, as we said. James discusses that. We won't go into it now. But he tells us just exactly how we're led away. And eventually being tempted, we bring it into the act of sinning. Now, continuing with these matters. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hands. He knew that he came forth from God. He knew that he was going back to God. And you see that he rose from supper. And as the way they dressed in those days, he laid aside his outer garments. And here's where we need to understand something about the social activities of the Jews at that time. And we see that he took a towel and tied it around him. And he poured water in a basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. Well, he comes to Simon Peter. And Peter just didn't want to have anything to do with that. He objected strongly. And he said, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, as he was wont to do, if I don't wash you, your feet, you don't have any part with me. Well, Peter acted in true to form. In other words, he said, in that case, then wash me all over. But let's pause here and think about this just for a moment. That may not mean much to us today, but when people walk barefooted or in sandals, and virtually all mode of travel was walking in the dirt or filthy streets, then feet didn't just get a little dirty, and they could get quite dirty. It was considered a very lowly task to wash somebody's feet. It was something that would be done for all travelers when they arrived at their destination because it was a refreshing thing and th thus they would be prepared to do that. But it would be the servant, the slave's position to wash people's feet. Now, there have been those, before I go further, to try to make an act of worship 
out of washing feet. And there's some churches that as we partake the Lord's Supper and as we sing and so on, then they want to make foot washing a part of their worship. And they will argue it like this. Well, the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper out of the Passover feast. And also arising from supper, he washed the disciples' feet. Why do you take one and observe it as an act of worship and not take the other? Well, of course, all that's said about feet washing is not found in this one particular passage. You'll not find actual washing of feet, dirty feet that need washing. You will not find that located anywhere in the scriptures, but in the same way it's located here. You'll remember that as Timothy's talking about widows and giving qualifications for the widows indeed, those to be enrolled in the number, they had to meet certain qualifications. And one of them was, if she have washed the saints' feet, because that demonstrated a willingness to do whatever is necessary to help somebody, no matter how meager and lowly the task and distasteful the task might be. That's the very idea behind having a humble mind and being in a state of humility. That's what the Lord is teaching them. So when it comes to it being an act of worship, like the Lord's Supper, it can't be because the scripture is located as an act of humble service and a benevolent act not an act of worship. So what is he teaching them here? He's teaching them that he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. So Peter wanted to, as he bounced the other direction, said, well, wash me all over. And again, we see that he's talking about what needed washing because the Lord says, no, we'll wash your feet. We only are washing that which needs to be washed. I might say also concerning those who have foot washing as an act of worship, uh, they're not going to go waiting barefooted through the chicken yard or the cow lot before they sit down before the church and have the people come up and wash their feet. They're going to wash their feet before they have the people do it. So it's all completely missing the whole lesson the Lord is teaching here. Because he's teaching actually washing dirty feet, which customarily was taken, uh, done uh, by the servants, by the slaves. And the feet were actually dirty and it was a refreshing thing. So that's what was going on. We don't have that situation in our particular country. Some places of the world, it would still be something that would be an act of service. Christians are be ready to do whatever service they can for somebody else, no matter how low and distasteful the deed may be to help somebody. Now, he continues on uh, in this connection. The Lord said, you're clean, but not all. Well, here he set, uh, uses this opportunity to make a spiritual application. Of course, he had in mind Judas Iscariot, spiritual cleanliness came out of this, not in the actual washing of dirty feet to make the flesh clean, but to make an application, as the Lord so often did, meaning that the apostles were spiritually clean, but one of them wasn't. We know who that was. It was Judas Iscariot who was going to betray him. Well, when he finishes this task, he puts his garments back on and he reclines at the table. And I might mention this regarding the way that they partook of their meals. They didn't have tables that they sat at in chairs. They reclined on couches. That was typical. And that's what's going on at this time. And he says, you call me master or teacher and you call me Lord. Notice he says, and so I am. He says, if I've washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. Now he makes the application. A servant is not greater than his master. And one who is sent is not greater than the one who sent him. 
Thus, he's teaching them that true greatness in the kingdom of God is to do the lowliest of tasks and not think of the kingdom like a kingdom on this earth where the king is in the best of clothing and wealthy and perfumed and all of that kind of thing. That's not the way of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is service under the authority of the Christ in the words of the New Testament. And we see multiplicity of teachings throughout the New Testament to be mindful of those who don't have things or they have disabilities or they have whatever. And we're to be humble and not think of ourselves greater and better than they are. And that's kind of easy to do. James wrote to Christians and he even scolded them severely because of the way they were treating poor brethren. They were showing respect of persons. Well, that hasn't left us today. We can look at other members of the church and say, well, well, I'm far better than they are. Or what in the world makes them think they ought to this, that, and the other? Or why have we got to put up with this? Or let them set off over there. I remember a situation long years ago where the, you know, a lot of little towns had some derelict many times mentally he wasn't what he ought to be or could be a she, but in many cases it was a, a male. And this one place, this old fellow wandered around all the time. He, he was able to live in his own house such as it was. He wasn't living under the bridge or anything like that. But he had nothing but himself. And uh, he rarely took a bath. And uh, we were having a meeting, a gospel meeting. And he shows up after the thing starts. And he sat down back close to somebody. I don't even remember. I, where I know I can see in my mind where he sat. But I don't remember uh, who said, well, when it was said to him. And I'm pretty sure it was after we dismissed service that night. But I remember the lady who said it to him. And all she could do was berate him because he needed to go home and take a bath. Well, I will agree with her. He need to take a bath. But there was not very much of an attitude of saying, we're glad you came. Hope you come back. Because I say everybody in the town knew who he was or she knew who he was. And I know, I know well that she never meant to be putting him down because of his state. But um, sometimes we let ourselves, you know, just kind of get off into a position of where you got to be just like me or you, you know, I don't know where the Lord died for you or not. So we have to be careful. And we need this lesson just as much as Peter did. And that's why the Lord's teaching it. And that's why we're spending some time on it. Because there's all sorts of ways that we can show that we're not humble. And it's not necessarily because we neglect washing somebody's feet. Now, when you leave this portion, coming into verse uh, 18, all the way through verse 30, you have the Lord identifying his betrayer. So Jesus says it is that the scripture may be fulfilled that he's going to lose this man, if you were to say lose it, that this man would be lost. And he does it interesting. He says, he who, uh, basically, the way we'd said, hey, he who eats bread that I give him, he, he's the one that's lifting up his heel against me. He's the one that's opposing me. And he says, I'm telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you can believe that I am he. So even identifying before the fact to the apostles, Judas Iscariot, he's saying, I'm foretelling this for, as far as you're concerned so that you'll understand have even more uh, greater faith, maybe I should say. 
So he who receives, whomever I send, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him that sent me. When I think about that for a minute as we try to teach people. When we try to teach people the truth and they reject it, who are they in actuality rejecting? They're rejecting Christ. Because Christ has put into the uh, uh, responsibility of the church the teaching of the gospel. The gospel is God's power to save. So we are partners with the Lord, if you want to look at it that way. And I think that's an accurate way of looking at it. Now, Jesus is getting ready for all this to happen. I think that's important that we emphasize this. He knows what is coming. The apostles don't get it yet. But Jesus became troubled in spirit. And he said, Verily or truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. Well, you can imagine the rest of the apostles. That would trouble them. There would be some close in inspection of themselves. And Peter motions to John to get him to ask the Lord, uh, who is he speaking? Of whom is he speaking? So he says, well, you know, who is it? Well, the Lord answers in a funny way. It's the one for whom I shall dip the sop of this morsel and give it to him to eat. Well, he dipped the sop of the morsel and gave it directly to Judas Iscariot. Now, again, keep in mind what we've said about Satan. After he partook of it, the scripture tells us that Satan entered into him. Jesus, therefore, said to him, whatever you do, do it quickly. Now, let me pause here again and remind us of all that discourse at the beginning of the lesson about, the uh, beginning of this chapter in particular, about uh, the devil putting it into the heart. This has been going on in his mind for some time. And it's at this time that he decides to act. Now, the devil can enter into you or to me or anybody else in the same way he entered into Judas Iscariot. I won't repeat what I've already said. Remember the writer of Hebrews and warning Christians about departing from the New Testament system. He warned them about an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. He didn't say that to people outside of Christ. He said that to people in Christ. So I still have responsibility where I let go in my mind and what I think about, what I, med I meditate on. So, so much in the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, tells the man of God, the woman of God, what to think about. And just read the book of Philippians and see what you find along that line as to what we ought to think about. And there's a reason for that. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you meditate on evil things, and things contrary, of course, to the truth, is what I mean by evil things, the truth of God's word, if you set your mind and affections on the affairs of this present world, on fame and fortune, and being at peace, having all men speak well of you, and all those things, you'll end up being worldly. How do we think a person becomes worldly? Ex except that he thinks worldly. Well, how does a person become spiritual? He thinks spiritual. What do we mean spiritual? We mean the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, the New Testament in particular. And so James would say, here's our scripture again, James 1.25, 
Whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. So if you want to be worldly, then think worldly thoughts. Meditate on them. Set your goals on the affairs of this present world. Think like people who don't know Christ don't care to know him. Or like just outright atheists. Now, if you want to be like Christ, you have to think on these things. You have to set your affections on things above. And that means on the truth of God's word as to how we live here. That's how we set our affections on things above. So we need to make sure we understand how Satan approaches us, how Satan enters into us, and how we can resist Satan as we're taught, and he will flee from us. I think a good example of that is to remind us that when, as I've how many times, uh, Jesus is telling the apostles he's got to go up to Jerusalem and there be condemned and killed. And Peter tries to say, no, no, it won't happen to you. Well, that's thwarting the way God chose to save man. And it's the only way that man can be saved. And that's through the death of Christ on the cross. And Peter's trying to stop that. Now, what did the Lord say to Peter? Get thee behind me, Satan. Well, why? Poor old Peter, he just, didn't he have good intentions? And of course, we know what road is uh, to a certain place is paid with good intentions. And you can see it right there. Jesus had to die on the cross, a sacrifice for our sins. Peter's trying to stop him. Well, that only plays in the hands of Satan. Nobody could be saved without Christ dying on the cross. So we might do well to realize when we have thoughts that go contrary to the truth of God, then just say, get thee behind me, Satan. Throw those thoughts out. Think on the things that God has given us to think about. And that's what we need to understand. And the Lord is helping us do some of that right here. But it was at this time that Judas immediately went out. It was nighttime. And then we come down to verse 31 and through 35. And our Lord is continuing to talk with the disciples. He said, now is the son of man glorified. And God is glorified in him. I said last week, here he is about to undergo these terrible ordeal of the garden of Gethsemane. And then the actual all night long kangaroo courts and all that culminating in finally his crucifixion. And, and this is glorifying him. Well, of course it's glorifying him. He's making the way for the salvation of man as he goes through all of this. He says um, to them, to his disciples, I'll, I'll be with you a little longer. Then he says, you're going to seek me and where I'm going, you can't come. Then he tells them a new commandment I give to you. And he says that you love one another. But he gives them a guideline. You love one another. As I have loved you, you also love one another. Well, now all they had to do was think of their day-to-day -day operation with him and how he treated them, what he said to them, understand how that love manifested itself. So we go further and we see that he says it will be this kind of love whereby all men shall know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. This is the reason godly living, Christian living is so important. The world knows exactly what the church purports to be. That is, every member of the church is a Christian. Christian means of Christ. And the world will see very quickly when someone is claiming to be one thing and something else. Maybe that's a good time for us to stop right there. And we can pick up on that next week. If you will, before we end class, let's go to Heavenly Father in prayer and then we'll be finished for the night. Please bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we're again thankful we can be together 
the midst of this busy week to study thy word. And we pray that we will show forth the love of Christ in our life in the way that he did, in obedience to thy truth, in our dealings with thee and in one another. Help us to be ready unto every good work. Help us to constantly study thy word and to ever worship thee in spirit and in truth, to do all things by the authority of thy Son. Guide us and be with those who are sick and afflicted and orphaned, the old and feeble and those who lost loved ones. Help us always, Father, to realize thy love for us and how we ought to love one another. Forgive us of our many sins. Help us, Father, to truly repent and turn from them. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen.